Why don't you just come clean and say what you mean? That black boys are no good. Let me tell all y'all something. Most black boys don't go to jail. You won't see most black boys in the 6 o'clock news. Most black boys don't sell drugs. You know the one that really gets to me? The one that gets under my skin. All of y'all saying that 50% of black boys dropping out of high school. I got 400 years of lots of society telling me I'm no good. But you know what hurts me the most? Is that my own people. You tell me that I have a better chance at failing. Then I do it succeed. I think it's time we start a new conversation. Black America, you need to know this. 82.1% of black men over the age of 18 have a high school diploma or GED. Black man 18 to 24 are enrolled in college. And we ain't talk about Bible school. 32.3% of oh, black men 18 to 24 are in college right now. Man, that's one out of three. 6.3% of all black men are enrolled in college right now. Here's the news flash. The only men that get enrolled in college more than black men is Asian men. Y'all, please, please, pretty please stop this. There are more black men in college than there is in jail. Now for all y'all that said half of us dropped out of high school, this is the number. So I see all of the news reports, all of the newspaper, magazine, and internet articles, all of the Facebook statuses and events, the Twitter hashtags, and I can't help but wonder, would it do the same for me? What if it was me? What if I lost a fist fight to a gun hugged too tightly by its owners? With the heat of racial profiling and prejudice from that barrel rocking an entire nation enough to protest violence and injustice once again? I wonder if there would be fist pumps, competitive chants, and picket signs in my honor. Would they mail empty cans of Sprite or empty boxes of lemon heads to my killer? And to my killer. I wonder how he would feel, knowing that the backlash is coming because he shot a young black man down. I wonder if they would write him letters filled with hatred and passion and rebellion and all of the other things that are boiling inside. Hearts heavy with pain, scribbling poems of anger, holding on to a higher foundation like hangers. And the, the dangers are obvious. They are what I am up against every single day of my life. Just because I was born with a skin tone similar to Earth doesn't mean that it's supposed to be treated like dirt. I wonder how, I wonder if our feelings would matter to anybody. Would I become the hashtag of the moment? Would people express their appreciation for a group of words in my honor with a simple thumbs up from a father? I wonder if anybody would care about, I wonder if anybody would actually care about pursuing justice instead of just praising the idea of it. Us human folks have the tendency to crush the possibility of change under the weight of bad life experiences. Hope doesn't seem to be as plentiful as it used to be. Where I come from, it doesn't get a lot of coverage. And it's because it isn't what the people want to hear. Which leads me to wonder if the media would attempt a full court press on mother's privacy. I wonder how she would feel. Knowing that she is famous by associations to the victim of a heinous crime, I wonder if she will realize that the high profile investigation being conducted is saturated in bullshit, serving as a distraction to the heart of the situation. A child was murdered. A child was murdered. The semantics shouldn't matter, but unfortunately they do. Who, when, why always matters and the focus is usually on everything else except for what it is. And it's messed up. Like sexism, oppression. Racism, violence, the things that drive us apart and pit us against each other. Who really wants to face these things? When will we come together to fight against it? When will we come together to fight the things that hurt us? Where will we go if things stay the way they are? Why do people have to die in senseless matters in order to, in order to bring attention to social injustices? I just hope that something will happen that can bring about a kind of understanding strong enough to influence change. So I won't have to wonder as much. Peace. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Congressman Stephen Horsford from the great state of Nevada, one of the newest members of the Congressional Black Caucus. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here for this Trayvon Martin, a youth forum on race, equality, justice, 
and the path forward. Let's give Brandon Douglas a round of applause for his spoken word. And I'm very excited to be with all of you today. I'm grateful to the students who, who have agreed to participate on this panel and to Ms. Angela Rye for moderating today's discussion. We are here to discuss issues of race, equality, and justice with respect to Trayvon Martin. I would like to acknowledge my fellow classmate, Representative Hakeem Jeffries, who will be joining us. And we also have uh, members from the Florida legislature who are here. Mr. And if they could stand and be recognized, Mr. Alan West from the District 8, who is the House Democratic Whip and, and Chair of the Black Caucus in Florida. Williams, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alan Williams. <laughs> we also have Cynthia Stafford from Florida House of Representatives, District 109. And Representative Barbara Watson from Florida's House uh, Representative, District 107. Thank you for joining us and for leading the way with uh, the legislation in Florida. Although the Trayvon Martin tragedy exposed social issues of prejudice, discrimination, and racism, the issue goes further. We must recognize that institutional problems such as racial profiling, stop and frisk policies, and disparities in our justice system are also harsh realities that all of us as minorities continue to face on a daily basis. We are all well aware that there are still challenges that our society faces. When an individual is targeted based on the color of his or her skin, we cannot sit back and accept racist policies. I'm a father of three, and every parent knows what it feels like to worry about your own child. We worry about where they are and whether they're safe. We shouldn't have to worry when our children leave for the school day or are at an activity after school, whether they will be harassed coming home from, from school or at a convenience store. Our children deserve to live free from fear. Their childhood should not be plagued with the need to constantly look over their shoulder or the worry that someone might think quote, they look dangerous. They shouldn't be worried that they're going to be profiled by anyone. No one should accept profiling or discrimination. Where discrimination is institutionalized through practices such as racial profiling, stop and frisk, and disparities in our justice system, Congress has a duty to act. Our, our legislatures across the country have a duty to respond. That's why we are here today, and I'm proud to announce that I will be introducing a bill along with other members of Congress to require a comprehensive review of law enforcement policies to eliminate procedures that lead to racial profiling. <laughs> Working with other members of the Congressional Black Caucus and allies within the co Congress we hope and expect that there will be action, as Brandon just talked about, and that the events, the horrific events that led to the death of Trayvon Martin are responded to, and all of us collectively can take action. I look forward to the comments from uh, the panel that we are about to hear from, and the lessons that we can learn from the incident with Trayvon. But I think that the underlying concern is that we all need to work together to make our society fairer and more just for everyone. And that's what I plan to focus on with this bill and this conversation together. As the video spotlighted, it's time for us to change the conversation. We have black boys and black men that are successful. 
that deserve an opportunity to not be profiled or judged or discriminated against. And it's time that we change the conversation and it starts with all of us here today. So it's my privilege to introduce Ms. Angela Rye, uh, who will moderate our discussion today with our great panelists of young people. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Congressman Horsford. And before we get started, um, I just want to take the opportunity, um, a point of personal privilege, to say to you when I think about the comments that the President made that I am Trayvon, or I could have been Trayvon Martin and Trayvon Martin could have been me. I think that Stephen Horsford is another example of that. And I'm saying that because he grew up and had a challenging time. He grew up supporting his mother and working alongside his siblings to make sure that they all had a brighter future. And as a result of that, Congressman Horsford was the first ever black Senate majority leader in the state of Nevada. And now he's the first ever African American congressman from the state of Nevada. And that's history being made because it's not done. So thank you so much for that. And to that point, I was just telling the panelists in the back, this is a difficult and courageous topic for him to handle because of the makeup of his district. So that we also appreciate Congressman Horsford. With that, I want to welcome our panelists today. First, we have, oh, this is not in order, but that's okay. You all can line up when you hear your name. Um, Nia Davis, who is a third year law student at Georgetown University uh, Law Center. She is a, she's very passionate about civil rights and social justice issues in K through 12 education policy. You can see why she's on the panel today. I also have to say I'm elated that she is a proud member of the Black Law Students Association. Um, for personal reasons, I definitely appreciate that, and thank you so much for joining us today, Nia. Um, also, you can give a round of applause now. Thank you. I also want to welcome Mason Wiley, who is a JD candidate at American University, Washington College of Law, all these up-and-coming lawyers. Um, he's also seeking a master's degree in international affairs. His primary focus is on minority and indigenous rights. He's a founder and president of the ACLU chapter at his school and is a staff member of American University's International Law Review. Welcome, Mason. <laughs> Next, we have Silver Briscoe. She is the 2013 International Junior Miss District of Columbia Teen. This is her third title since she has been in high school. Silver's platform, Breaking the Cycle, Bullying is Not a Rite of Passage, is not only going to be relevant for what she's doing um, in the future, but also very relevant today. Some folks might not like it, but I will say that I think that the actions George Zimmerman took were bullying. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and Silver, I hope you'll be able to contribute to that aspect of the conversation. Welcome. Next, we have Jonathan Johnson, who is a current senior at the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Senior High School, where he serves on the Senior Class Council as Assistant Director of Publicity. You might, I might need some help with that, sir. I might need some help with that. <laughs> um, as a dual sports athlete, both football and basketball, Jonathan plans to attend the University of Marshall, where he will double major in English and broadcast journalism. His future aspiration is to become a sports writer for the Washington Post. Welcome, Jonathan. He's one of those uh, statistics that you saw earlier in that video. We're glad that you will be graduating soon and matriculating on to college. So Anthony Miller, he is a recent graduate from Howard University with a BA in economics. Anthony hails from Cleveland, Ohio, resides in DC, and is now a first year graduate student at Howard University studying sociology. Welcome, Anthony. And last but certainly not least, we have Tiffany Lofton, who serves as the vote coordinator for Dream Defenders. We'll let Tiffany tell you a little bit more about herself as we get into this conversation. So today, yes, welcome Tiffany. Today I think it's really important um, for us to treat this conversation as one we would at the dinner table with family. Um, we want this to be an engaging dialogue where you all don't see this table or this podium as a barrier. Um, it just happens to be here, some place for them to rest their arms. Um, but just really engage with us. So we have a floating mic. Um, I'll walk around to help get questions. 
Um, I also want to say Alan Williams, not West, <laughs> um, is a good friend of mine, and I hope that we can allow Alan the opportunity to talk about the Stand Your Ground repeal in Florida that he's working on. So thank you all for being here today. Um, we're going to jump right into questions. The first thing that I want you all um, to help me with is the concept of racial profiling and your experiences with it. And just uh, to do a little focus group in here, because remember we said this is a family talk, how many of you all have had um, a not so good experience with law enforcement? Please raise your hands. So that's the majority of the room. Um, so panelists, we've talked a little bit before about just talking about what those experiences look like. Brief, because again, we want to have an engaging discussion with everyone in here. But talk to me a little bit about your experiences with racial profiling. OK, I guess I'll start. Um, so hi again. My name's Nia Davis. Um, I went to undergrad in Philly. And I had a good friend, Kwabena, who is actually Jamaican of Ghanaian descent. Um, and you know, had a run in with the law a little bit on campus. Um, a couple, something happened like nearby at a party and someone with his description um, kind of fit the bill and, and uh, the police security, um, the campus security stopped him. And you know, he explained he was a student on campus, like he was just walking me home um, and nothing was happening. And I remember his comment after the fact, it was what struck me, struck me the most about the experience. He said that, you know, he grew up in Kingston, not the safest place, um, but that he was more afraid of being in the United States, because at least in Kingston, you know, it was a wrong time, wrong place. But in the United States, all he had to do was be black. And that, that stayed with me for a really long time. Um, OK, anybody else? You can go first. Hi, everyone. Uh, oh, it's a lot. OK. Uh, Tiffany Dina Lofton from Los Angeles, California, born and raised. And I graduated from the University of California, Santa Cruz, in Northern California with um, ethnic studies and political science. I'm also the former president for the United States Student Association. We're the country's oldest and largest student-run, student-led organization. Now I serve as the vote coordinator for Dream Defenders. So my experience being on the West Coast, as some can imagine who are from the South or HBCUs, is completely different with ra uh, racial profiling. Uh, you all might have heard through either online media sources or through the national media what happened in uh, Black History Month in 2010 at the University of California school system when there was a white fraternity at UC San Diego that decided to host a black party called the Gangster Party. And they painted themselves in black shoe polish and hung up pictures of monkeys and guns and black people and said, come and learn how to be the best N-word. We're going to show you how to wear your weaves and your baby fat and so on and so forth. And then on my campus, they hung a full-blown noose on Science Hill in the bathroom. This is all during Black History Month when the campus fired our African American Resource Center director, and I also let go the top black position on campus, and she was the vice chancellor for student affairs. Her name was Felicia McGinty. And so they had a, a huge crisis that had happened around the black community. Out of 18,000 students, there were um, 400 black students on campus. I was the president of the student government on my school, at my school, and when this happened, it was a direct attack on our communities, especially during Black History Month. It, any time of the year, it was especially, but especially during Black History Month, when there was no celebration of our culture, no recognition of the campus and the, uh, the faculty that are on campus who had those degrees, who were black professors and who were also on adjunct or getting laid off. And so that was my first experience, is recognizing that we weren't being prioritized on a white, predominantly white university, and that um, although they didn't even recruit us to get to the school, they were also pushing us out with budget cuts, with raising tuition, and now the attack of because of the color of my skin. And so I moved to DC right after college to work for the National Student Association and have been doing social justice, racial equality, voter registration work since then. Thank you, Tiffany. I think what Tiffany raises is a good point, right? Because now we've broadened the discussion just a little bit beyond racial profiling by law enforcement but also with addressing racial discrimination, period. Whether we've experienced it across the street with a neighbor or we've experienced it institutionally at our schools or in our places of work, um, which is a frightening proposition, particularly when you don't have a listening ear. Um, so are there other examples here? You all can talk about either racial profiling or discrimination um, at your places of employment or with the law enforcement. Hi, Silver Briscoe. Um, my experience actually happened last school year before I transferred <laughs> the lights. <laughs> before I transferred to Dunbar Senior High School, um, I used to attend Howard 
D. Woodson in Northeast D.C. And I was jumped. And me and my mom went to the police about it to see if it was anything they could do about the situation. And they did nothing. It was basically told to me, you're black. We expect this of you. We expect you to fight. We expect people of your color, people in your generation, people in your age range, to do stupid things like this, to stoop to this level. And that just showed me the lo- how to look at the justice system now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, you all don't have to answer this question. You all have one? Okay. So the reason why I wanted to do that really quick is to lay the foundation Um, The congressman mentioned um, his bill, the Universal Respect Act, um, which I think is important for us to kind of consider. A lot of state legislators consider racial profiling as an issue that needs to be addressed in the states. What we've seen post the George Zimmerman verdict is that this is something we need to look at holistically. I think that that point was anchored when you see what happened um, with New York. Um, The stop and frisk law in New York or policy in New York was found to be unconstitutional. Um, I had a friend recently in New York, African American male, lawyer, walking down the street with his book bag and his luggage, getting ready to go on an international trip and was stopped and frisked walking down the street in New York. Um, So I think that, again, we need to talk a little bit about what we can do to change the policies because sometimes, and we've seen this throughout history, policies help us to change the way that we think. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's not the other way around. So here we have kind of our whole community that thinks a certain way about racial profiling and stop and frisk. We all know that it's not right. But there's something in the psyche, um, because folks actually profile us even without a policy, where people can't understand why it's so bad. So let's talk a little bit about the things that we can do, whether it's legislatively or in our community, to start changing the mindset on racial profiling, on stop and frisk, on stand your ground, so that we can really make a difference. Maybe um, for the high school students in particular, you can talk about things that you've done on a smaller scale to deal with gun violence and that kind of thing, and we can bring it back to a larger level, what we can do nationally. I'm leaning on you two down here, because you haven't said much. My, my name is Anthony Miller. Uh, I serve as the president of the student body at Howard University, um, and I think what you said is uh, is very it's, it's right spot on. Because a lot of times it's not just the the policies uh, that perpetuate um, racial profiling. It's the it's just the way we think, the way some people think, and the the mindset that a lot of people have. Um, that even if you change the policy, you know, there's still going to be people. Um, that have that mindset and that think about um, African Americans, black people, you know, Hispanic people, or you know, any people of color as less um, in this society. So it is definitely we definitely have to look at structural things um, that can be changed. I think you know, stop and frisk was a very glaring example of um, of a policy that perpetuated. Uh, that that stereotype that's being put on our our community. So it's 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 a difficult thing to even you know begin to attack because it's a it's a mindset, it's a it's a thought process that a lot of people have. And so, I mean, I think the the first thing we have to do is you know take a look at the policies and the the disparities between the application of those policies because I think that's one of the main reasons that they found um, stop and frisk to be unconstitutional because you looked at the the statistics that showed very blatantly and you know that the majority of the people that were stopped in frisk were, were African American or Hispanic. And, and that's, you know, it's a direct correlation between that and uh, the, the sentiment in this country of the, that we should be profiled and we are seen as dangerous. Um, and so it's definitely difficult, uh, a difficult thing to attack, but I think it's, it's, it's incremental. It's, you gotta take steps, you know, at looking and looking at policies because, you know, you just throw the the racism card out there, then everybody pegs you as, oh, this person that wants to say that everybody's racist and racism is gone in this country. And and it's not, but we have to, we had to identify it. We had to be very specific and strategic about how we do that um, and looking at the statistics and showing them, you know, this is, these are the problems that we have and these are the, 
these are the laws or the uh, policies that perpetuate those, uh, those, those things. So what I think I hear you saying is that there's an education process that has to take place before we can even really start hoping that policies will stick. So for example, in the House of Representatives here, where we are in the nation's capital in the Beltway, bills are introduced all the time and they sit, um, particularly in this political climate. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation is a nonprofit, but I'm telling you my political opinion, that bills just sit because it's a very divisive environment right now. I think that we're seeing racism in a real different way. It's changed forms, but we all know what it is because we've experienced it for all of our lives. Um, so I think that's an excellent point, educating is and building awareness is a great foundational way to begin to change policies. Are there other thoughts on that? I was just going to add that um, on top of being very upfront about the racism that does still exist, there's a lot of open conversations that I think we all need to have with our friends and family about the, the less overt racism that we have. There's a lot of implicit bias out there, um, and there are a lot of people who aren't aware of what it is or, or how it affects them on an everyday basis. Um, and that includes all of us in our community, but that also includes our friends and our family. Um, and to that point, I was talking with my roommate, she's Italian American, um, and she suggested that I suggest that all of you get um, your non-black friends to read uh, the uh, Backpack Privilege essay mm. that was written. It's, it's just like 23 it's just straightforward points on white privilege and what that means in the real world for people walking around. Um, and I read it, and, and it really is fantastic, you know? It, it has just very simple things about um, what it means to carry around an implicit bias about people, you know? White privilege is being able to walk down the street and not have someone cross the street to avoid you. Mm -hmm. Something like that is not something that we're necessarily aware of or that we necessarily speak about, but it is a conversation that I think would move us forward um, on a very micro level to be able to have these more open conversations without throwing around racist and without having people automatically go on the defensive. So one thing, um, too, that I think is important, and I should have mentioned it earlier, but this conversation, I think, is abundantly important because of what happened earlier this week. Um, it's a cause for a little bit of alarm. Um, but I wonder how many of you all, um, and, and the panel too, looked at the TV and when you saw that the shooter at the DC Navy Yard was an African American male, not only shocked, but scared about what that meant now for the loved ones in your life that look similar to him. Maybe they have a similar athletic build or, you know, maybe if they had a bad day, they're not smiling. But what does that mean for profiling here again? We saw that with our Muslim brothers and sisters right after 9-11. Um, I think it was a reality that they began to live out in a way that, again, we've been familiar with for all of our lives. Um, so I just wonder if there are thoughts on that, what your immediate thoughts were when you saw, you know, number one, there's a shooter. Number two, we couldn't move anything, not even a background check on the Hill when we started talking about gun safety. But again, thinking about, okay, what are the solutions when you're dealing with a profiling issue when it's fresh and it's really hard to have that conversation? And two, what do you do about really trying to solve the policy challenge we have with guns? Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I actually grew up in the LaDroit Park area near Howard, um, so I seen a lot of gun violence. Seeing this, the Howard student body made me navigate more and be more active in school so I can get to college, any college. Um, not a lot of people in my family actually like went to college or even graduated from college if they did go. As uh, far as gun violence, um, I think I'm sorry, as far as my, my feelings towards the shooting on the Navy Yard, when I first heard about it, I was shocked. I didn't, I didn't actually understand the, the full um, details of what happened. My mother, uh, I had woke up, and my mother had told me to cut on the news, and I, I actually seen what happened. I mean, I think it was senseless, because he, he took 12 people, I believe it's 12, right? Mm -hmm. He took 12 people. 13, including him, but that's 13, right. including himself? Yeah, that's 13 including. You okay. were right. It's 12 people that he was lied to. He, he took his life and 12 other people's life for no reason at all. Like, it was just like, what was the point? 
that that's how, that's just how I felt about it. And I think that's, that's, you bring up another good point. No reason at all to us, but there was some reason to him. Yeah. So the, also the mental health component of this. Like we keep brushing right. past the fact that somehow folks are able to get weapons and they're not mentally stable. Somehow, you know, they're able to get tons of ammunition when nobody needs that. They're clearly doing something wrong. He had run-ins with the law. He shot through his, I think is the ceiling of his last apartment. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these other pieces that we just continue to miss. And he passed a background check. So while we're arguing about the hurdle of a background check period, the background checks we have right now aren't strong enough. So let's um, talk a little bit about, is ACLU doing something specific on um, gun violence right now? Are you doing something on your campus you wanna? I just saw you perk up, so I wanted to make sure I reached out to you. And um, the ACLU, as far as I'm aware, is, is uh, they're interested in gun violence, but that's sure. not anything that I'm uh, particularly focused on. Um, I would say that, to me, the Trayvon Martin shooting and and, and what we're talking about right now, uh, it's the proliferation of, of guns that's throughout society right now, and it's, it largely affects the young black population. And I think it's very insensitive that we, that we ignore it for the most part, and that there's a lot of lobbies that push this, and that we, um, uh, yeah, I think it's, um, it's a shame. Okay, what I want to do now, because we've had some call and response, even though it maybe not have been intentional, but I understand we can have church anywhere, right, y'all? So um, I want to open it up um, to the floor for questions, and I will come over to you. What I will say is that this is a question, right? So like, let's not do the mini sermons, please. I have the mic. I'm going to hold it. So is this on? <laughs> Hello? Yes. Okay, so questions. Yes. And state your name and where you're from. This is Family Talk. I'm going to hold it. Okay. My name is Fahima Sek. I'm from, originally from Harlem. I'm a professor at Bowie State University. And I just wanted to say um, the situation with the man, young man at uh, the D.C. Army. In fact, one of my colleagues' sister was uh, murdered, unfortunately. I found that out yesterday. But it doesn't take stuff like that necessarily for them to profile us because the young man the other day who was looking for help Right. from the police was shot down. I mean, he wasn't run away from the police. Mm -hmm. And I'm really emotional about this. He was running to them. So it doesn't even take issues like that for them to profile us. That's a good point. Does anybody on the panel want to address that? that for those of you that don't know, she's talking about the Florida Jonathan a and University former football player. Yeah, um, Jonathan, Jonathan Burrell was 24 years old. And um, this is a couple of days ago. He had gotten to a really bad car accident out on the side of the street by himself and had to crawl out the back window is the story that we've been told uh, to be able to get out of his car. And when he ran to the closest house to ask someone to call him and wanted to look for help, um, the young woman or the old lady that came to the door thought it was her husband. And when she realized it wasn't her husband, she called 911. When the police got there, they shot him 10 times and killed him. Um, and tased him too. And tased him too. Okay. And so, and so that's like a whole issue of racial profiling and the gun violence law and all of the pieces. And, and I want us to remember, of course, when we talk about this, because there's been so many different pieces of this situation, it's not, it's not just racial profiling, it's not just racism, it's not just gun violence, it's all of those pieces. And we have to do work on all of them to be able to get this done um, and to fix it and stop and frisk is its policy. And so I'm really excited about the bill that's being introduced by the Congress member. Um, my first time hearing about it, so I'm going to go back and tell the Dream Defenders, which is pretty cool. And so, um, and so, yeah. So that that's what happened. But we have to think about all the pieces to it. It's like, it's like student debt. It's not just student debt. It's college affordability. So when we talk about racism, we have to talk about all of these things and all the pieces to it. And we all have work to do. Some more questions. I think I'm going to stay back here. <laughs> My name is KB and Ritter from Orangeburg, South Carolina. I'm a freshman um, student at Howard University. And um, in today's society, it's so hard to be a young African-American man because you get profiled. And if you're not dressed to the T at all times, they may catch you on a bad day. And you may just have your normal clothes on. You may just be transitioning from one place to the other. And in that experience, you receive prejudice. And I was wondering from the panel, how do you handle open racism or open prejudice that you can blatantly see without playing into the stereotype and perpetuating the cycle of the angry black man? Um, 
I actually have like the same situations because I'm very into uh, sneakers. So like when I when I walk down the street or something, it, it, like the the police would just look at me like. It just be like a weird feeling you can get it. I mean, the way I deal with it, I, I just keep my head straight and I, I keep walking. Basically, I'm, I really I really don't see like nothing really that you can really do. That's my way, uh, but just to keep, keep moving on. So Jonathan, I'm gonna push back on that a little bit because I think the one thing that we really have to think through is why you feel so defeated about that. You know, like that's something that's not unique to Jonathan. What he said, I think, is striking. He said he just keeps his head straight because there's not really anything he can do about it. And this is just because he likes sneakers. There are a lot of young people that think just like that. And so we really, I think we should really use this, the time in this forum to think about what we can do as individuals, as members of the organizations in which we're a part of. Maybe it's the NAAC, maybe it's the ACLU. Maybe it's leaning on our members in the Congressional Black Caucus to sign on to Congressman Horsford's bill. There are a number of things that we can do. We cannot afford to have our young people feeling defeated. We really cannot. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I didn't put three, y'all. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Io Handy Kenny. I'm a stress manager and a breathologist. Uh, I'm a grandmother of 15. Uh, I lost a son. And what I have seen in our community is that most of our young people are dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome of some sort. They've seen so much violence. They've seen a lot of their friends killed. If you ever go in the classroom and ask some of these children how many people have they seen killed or involved in some sort of violence, almost everyone will raise their hand. And I'd like to see how this bill can address that constant cycle of violence that you many of the children are growing up feeling very hopeless and disempowered about violence and that has to be addressed from a conflict resolution concept as well as a mental health concept how do you feel healthy and vibrant when you walk out of your door but constantly see cameras that show people killed around you uh, people underneath of the apartment building that my son lives in. A uh, little girl left the door and up the street she was stabbed. And so this is us hurting ourselves, but it's also what we see in the media with others hurting us. And so how do we address that? And if this bill could have an educational component that would, include, that would increase that mental health aspect to help us with this syndrome of post-traumatic stress, around violence, I think it would really be helpful. So one thing, just to be fair to my friend, Congressman Horsford, this bill, is, it's a racial profiling bill, right? So we have to be careful about our expectations and what we place on this member. Um, I don't think he would be opposed to helping with mental health too, because we're talking about that. I'm, it's his form, I'm going. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Those are great suggestions, and I will take them back the Congressional Black Caucus has formed a caucus on black men and boys that we are uh, continuing to take recommendations from our constituents around the country and bringing forward additional policies to address that. So I hear your concern around mental health care and addressing the community need around violence. And that is something that we've heard in other forums. If I could just elaborate briefly on the racial profiling legislation that we'll be working on. I serve on the Homeland Security Committee and we uh, provide funding through the Department of Homeland Security to local uh, law enforcement agencies throughout the country. And so our request in the legislation, I should say mandate, uh, will be that those agencies that re receive funding must report out on their practices as it pertains to racial profiling. Because if the federal government is providing funding to those agencies, then they have a requirement and an accountability to us to ensure that racial profiling doesn't exist. So that's why we've focused on that specific area. Uh, and we can hold local law enforcement more accountable because we have the power of taking away that money. I'm gonna go back to this young lady and I'll come back. Oh, were there any comments from the panel on that question? 
Um, I wanted to actually comment on the first question from the student from Howard University um, and kind of talk about um, the, the racial profiling and how do you, how do you kind of deal or how do you, what do you do um, when that happens and when you see that. And it's, it's a definitely a tough uh, situation to be in because you don't want to come off as uh, the angry black man um, who's always spewing, oh, there's racism here, racism there. Um, I think the, one, of the, one of the things that I do um, is just speak to them. Like, you, you see somebody that's you know, racially profiling you or looking at you like a police officer or the you know, uh, person that's crossing the street because you're walking down. Just, hey, how's it going? How are you? Um, and it just it just kind of shows them that I'm not I'm not here to you know put any harm upon you. And I but I also think we have to take it. We also have to take a look inside of, of us as well because I think I've I've done this. I've I've walked across the street because I saw someone in a hoodie walking down the street and I was like, oh, it's late at night. Let me make sure that I'm not doing anything. Let me make sure that I'm as safe as possible because and when one of the things that I've experienced um, this summer was uh, my friend um, and my roommate was actually killed on my street. Um, at Howard University um, uh, by, uh, but, by just a, a, other, a person trying to rob him. Um, so it's, it's I don't, but I think this, this conversation that we're having in here is more uh, along the lines of racial profiling and not um, black on uh, black uh, in incidents. And I want to make sure that we kind of focus on that and really have that conversation and really come up with some um, like Mr. Rice said, some, some things to take away from this and some things that we can really do individually um, when we leave here and when we, um, when we go back into our communities and when we, uh, how do we combat this on an individual basis? Because I think that's going to be the most powerful thing to take away from here. Um, as far as empowering uh, young black men so that they, uh, when, we, when you go to law school, they teach you in criminal procedure that the way that police officers try to engage with people is they find any reason to come up and talk to you and then they try to figure out a way to further the encounter if they think that there's anything going on. Mm -hmm. The problem is that most young people, uh, and this, this is for anybody, uh, don't understand what their rights are. They don't know what the police officers are allowed to do. They don't know how long they're allowed to detain them, what they're allowed to ask them. And at one point, they can disengage from the encounter. Um, I know that right now there are classes uh, that are taught by uh, different uh, universities. I think I you're can, involved I in I can it. speak to that. Yeah. Do you want me to? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so there is a program, one of many I know that exists in DC called Street Law. Um, I was a participant of the Street Law Clinic at Georgetown University Law Center. There are also a number of them at many law schools within this area and I think across the nation. Um, and I had the good fortune of teaching a class at Duke Ellington High School um, of 10th and 11th graders who like you said, didn't really understand what their rights under the law were. And being able to, first of all, teach them just very substantive, like if there is no reason for them to stop you, like you are allowed to go on your way. Like if you're not getting arrested, you keep moving. Um, but it's also the opportunity and kind of to speak to a question that was posed a little bit earlier, um, an opportunity for, for young people to air their feelings about things together in a community um, to kind of deal with the post-traumatic stress um, that they might experience or even just to understand that they have colleagues who are experiencing something very different from what they have. Um, and uh, I think that street law in particular and any opportunity that any young person has to engage with the law, with the system, to understand how it works, and to kind of take ownership over it is a blessing and something that we need to encourage. Um, because it is empowering and it is one of those things that, you know, as it starts with you, like it can definitely start with them there. And, and when we're talking about things that are taught in school, there's, there's really no reason why this shouldn't be taught. I mean, it's, it's a very important thing that not only teaches people how to take care of themselves in these situations, but it also teaches them a lot about what civil liberties are, which is a big part of what this country is, is supposed to be about, right? Hi, my name's Nakara Campbell. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I am actually a senior at the University of Maryland College Park. Go Terps. Um, <laughs> but this is more like proposed to my student leaders. I am actually the president of NCNW, that's National Council of Negro Women at Maryland. And NAACP and us just had a meeting about reflecting actually about the Trayvon Martin case and what we can do to move forward. So it's more of a question is how can we as student leaders as the driving force of basically civil rights at the University of Maryland try to mobilize us all as students and try to affect change because we really do want to help repeal Stand Your Ground. Before any of you jump in, T, 
Tiffany, I was gonna ask this. Thank you, this is a perfect segue. I want you to talk about the action that Dream Defenders took in Florida in response to her, because that's definitely something they can do. But also, for those of you that did not know, Dream Defenders is not brand new. And for those of you that have not heard what they've done in Florida with Governor Rick Scott, I want you to talk about that, Tiffany. Sure. So um, 2012 in June, May-ish, uh, is when Dream Defenders started. So we've been around for a little over a year now. Uh, so we, we're fairly, I guess not new, but fairly new as an organization. We're not, we don't have tax status yet, so we're working on that. Um, and what we've done is right after July 15th, when the verdict came out um, in the evening with George Zimmerman getting acquitted, we uh, took over the Capitol and took over Governor Rick Scott's office. We had about 50 people go straight to the Capitol, and throughout the 31 days that we occupied that building, we had thousands upon thousands of people come and visit, um, spend the night, sleep, and stay on marble floor. Uh, we didn't actually spend the night in his office office because the police officers kicked us out and we slept in the hallway, but nevertheless, we didn't leave the building. And that building opened at 7 a.m. and closed at 5 p.m. every day. And when we wanted to stay over the weekend, which is what we did, we stayed from Friday and we weren't able to go outside until Monday morning. So I was down there for 10 days uh, as the former president of all of the students in the country. It was a really big responsibility. I think a lot of folks felt connected to what happened, especially if you have the same skin, skin color as I do. And um, a lot of our young folks who were at FAMU or the NAACP chapters and things really stood there, one, I think, for the fundamental belief in rights and the funda fundamental belief in community and the protection of young people and the protection of ourselves. I think that was, that's what drove people spiritually to that, to that space. And they had folks come from uh, you know, uh, correction schools. They had people come from, we had a lawyer from Loyola who drove from uh, North, uh, New Orleans to come and stay with us for a couple of nights. We had someone um, come down from Brooklyn, New York and stay the whole time we were there. And there were folks from all over the place. Um, and it, it was a really empowering space and session just because we held our own sessions when Congress and when the State House said that you know we wanted to give you a session or the governor said, y'all should just pray about this, but I'm not gonna do anything for you all. We had our own sessions in his office and we stuck in there and we stayed there and we recorded them, we live streamed them and we had thousands of people view them from all across the world, all across the world. Watch our Ustreams, we had press conferences there, we had, um, uh, we, yeah, we had press conferences there. We had people shipping pizza, of course, and all the other really cool stuff. But what it really did was remind us through our trainings that we hosted, either through ourselves or special guests came to the actual Capitol for us and did trainings on not, uh, you know, nonviolent direct action trainings or trainings on how to speak to the press. There's trainings on lobbying and trainings on, uh, you know, one on ones on how to build relationships so that this movement got bigger and that our organization grew. We had um, a, a really, it was an, it was. I can't even describe the feelings that happened in that space. And um, what we really tried to accomplish was a couple of things. One was recognition on this issue that we're not going to take it anymore. Once you mess with the, the young people, that means that you're messing with the future of this country and that's what we won't allow you to do. It's, it's one thing for, for black on black crime to happen or for racial profiling to happen and gun violence to happen, but when we start killing our youth who are in college or who are in high school or who are walking down the street Innocently, it, it's messing with the future of what this country is going to look like. And so what we wanted to do was make sure that it was not something that was, oh, here comes another one, and that, you know, there's another one, and another name, and another name. We, we're ending it. That's it. We don't want any more. We don't want any more uh, mistakes to happen. And with Jonathan Farrell that's, that's taking place, or with Israel, or Stop and Frisk, or my friend Dijon who passed away in, in Los Angeles um, through a homicide, like there, there's a lot of things that are taking place and we don't want them to continue to go unnoticed. We can't lose any more black people and brown people. And so what the Dream Defenders, our organization is uh, brown and black youth who are either students or young youth who um, are stopping systematic oppression in the state of Florida and Tallahassee. And we're building that um, throughout the whole entire state with eight different chapters. And we're training those young people on how to be leaders and how to recruit more folks. And so I advise, just to answer the question, I advise when that happens, it, it's, it's not a waste of time and it's a very tedious task and a big responsibility 
to educate the students on your campus. It's a big responsibility, and it's not one, it's like, well, we don't feel like we're doing enough, we wanna go occupy Capital Two. If it's not strategic, don't do that, right? If there's no law there, that's in, that, don't do that. What is important, though, is that we educate each other, because there are people that are the same age as you and I, I'm 24, they're the same, pe same age that people that, that you and I, or people who look like us, who still don't believe in our power. And we have to be able to check them and let them know we do have power, no matter what we, you know, if we come out in numbers and that's all we have, that's power. And I'm really excited that SNCC leaders are coming back. We had Reverend Yearwood and John, Congressman John Lewis and some other people, Diane Nash, I actually just got finished talking to her last week. And there are some people who are coming back and saying, you all are our future. We have to claim that. The world is ours. We have to claim that and act like it. And so if we're going to do that on your campus, it just, it's just about educating those folks and letting them know, you know that, that we have agency and we're next. Good afternoon, thank you Angela, and thank you Congressman Horsford for this uh, forum. Uh, my name is Janae Grant, I'm a former chair of the Advisory Neighborhood Commission which is active out here in DC, particularly in Ward 5, but definitely a graduate of Howard University. And particularly coming to this session, our church wants to also have this type of discussion in-house. And what I wanted to ask was, even though we don't necessarily have fathers per se on the panel, but since we're having this family discussion, what are our fathers, uncles, big brothers, you know, um, saying to our, our sons, particularly so that we can prevent the nonverbal, what are they saying particularly about the nonverbal cues and gestures um, that the gentleman mentioned, since it is a mindset, as it relates to the stereotypes, when you see a young brother out there, whether he has a hoodie on, um, in terms of those cues, what are we saying to promote to our kids that, you know, you're outside and there's a non-safe world out there, but you need to be safe despite the fact that you're not doing anything to necessarily cause something to come upon you, but just due to the mindset, as a brother said on a panel, they prejudge you. So what are our men saying to our younger men so that we could prevent this, and particularly so we can have this discussion, somewhat similar to like how we used to promote going to college. We kind of need to get that promotion going back on. What can we say to one another? And again, we're trying to have this similar discussion in-house at our church, but we want to be able to equip our younger men. And, and so we kind of want to know what we can say to further encourage them, make them feel safe, but also be aware of the mindset that's out there. So maybe since there probably are not, are there any fathers on the panel? <laughs> okay, so I just, I figured, but. So if that's the question, what are the fathers saying? Maybe you all have mentors, big brothers, and fathers who have given you advice post Trayvon or um, otherwise, just period, because you all, um, well, Two of the three men have been black all their lives. <laughs> so, um, but I know you have friends and your own experiences, so we can talk about that as well. What are some of the things that your parents have told you? Um, well, my uncle, my um, one of my cousins, and my father, they my supporting cast. They push me to the uh, foot, the most, to do the best I can do. Um, before Trayvon Martin and, you know what I'm saying, after Trayvon Martin and all this, they always told me to be make sure that you on your um your P's and Q's because in reality you have three strikes. So I always wanted to be the best for them. So I, I try to like <laughs> not stereotype myself or anybody else because I I want to trust people. But you like at the same time you got to understand like who they are and what they are. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can speak to that definitely. Um, the mentors that I have and uh, my fa my parents. I have uh, three three older brothers, um, and we've really, we've definitely had this conversation um, on a number of different occasions. And I think uh, what he said is very uh, accurate. And it's but it's you don't have any strikes. You already have all of the strikes that are given to you. They you've already been presupposed um, into this um, position of being a threat or um, dangerous. Um, so you, you have to be on your P's and Q's at all times. You have to make sure that you're not doing anything that could be even um, seen as, uh, as negative or as dangerous or suspicious. 
um, because you're already suspicious, and that's the reality of the situation. And it's a sad reality, um, but that just means you have to be more. Um, you have to be take those extra steps to be on top and more conscious and aware of what what you're doing, so that you know people are already people have already presupposed you into this position. Um, your three strikes are already up, unfortunately. Um, and so that's that's pretty much the the encouragement that I have gotten is just make sure that you're always doing you know something that uh, no one can question and and if you are I think that what they said down there was a very very important you have to know what the what the laws are and what the rules are so that you can you can be on you can hey I'm not actually not doing anything um, and if I'm not being detained um, then what are what are we really talking about mm -hmm. um, so you just have to make sure that we educate people. Um, on their rights, and then make sure that you're always doing something, but make sure that you're not looking suspicious because you already look suspicious. So make sure that you're not doing anything suspicious. What does that mean, though? I think I think that part of, and I and I want to give some of the fathers in the room the opportunity to address this. Um, obviously, some of these things are out of our control, but what does it mean to look suspicious? Mm. I think that we really need to unpack that as well because. Right now, looking suspicious is just being a black man. Yep. Or be just being different. Difference is equa has equated somehow to suspicion. So what does that really mean? I would say just being black and young at the same yep. time. Because I got a couple of friends that's two years older than me, and they drive. So we go like places, and we just get pulled over just because we're young, and we're in a car. It's a car full of black, young males. So they, they, I think that's the stereotype that... Yeah. If you're young, bro, they're going to do something, or they're going to run this light, or they're going to do this, they're going to run this stop sign. I think, I think that's what it is. So fathers in the room, um, and ladies, I know there are questions, but I, I think this is an important conversation to have. We, we now know, in case any of you all missed it, that suspicious equals black. Um, I'm sure that's not a newsflash to anyone in here, but I think that because we know that, what you can tell your children to the sister's question in the back is, is this really tough? Who wants to have to have that conversation with your children? For those of you that are fathers, what have you said to them? I'm going to walk this around. I see you. Um, George Shorts from Brooklyn, New York. I pastor a church. I always tell my son, he's 25, very radical, big mouth, outspoken. And I said, you have to be careful. Carry yourself at all times respectful. Don't be with a whole lot of unseemly young people that's rowdy, you know, or causing a nuisance to the neighborhood because that draws attention also. And make sure you ask the question, speak, answer the question. I told him his rights and to carry himself respectful at all times. It's all right to play and have fun, but you got to be careful because you know what society you're living in today. And that's, that's basically all you can tell them. Don't be carrying drugs on you. I mean, we got to face it. We got to be real because a lot of people are into weed, you know, and they love smoking. You got to be careful because they can stop you. And if they search you and find something, that's a strike against you. And always tell him, don't put yourself into the hands of the judicial system. Let it be on their part, but never on yours, because you don't stand a chance. My name is Reginald Hart, and I am a pastor now in going in my fourth year. Stepped into it very late in life. But I have almost 30 years experience in men's ministry. <laughs> very successful at a church where I was active in the president of the men's ministry for, year, for a few years. And I'm going back about 20 years. And we were very successful <coughs> because we reached out in the community. We did a very good job of evangelizing the community. And that's how the church really grew. And now there are about 100 of those men, those young men. They were young when they came to us are now ordained preachers themselves. A lot of them have problems with authority. And so what happens is we some, some of our young men bring the situations on themselves. I appreciated what the young man over there said on the panel. 
my challenge right now with our young men, I don't know how to address the situation with wearing your pants down, okay? The manufacturers are making pants for men and women that will not fit at the waist, they only fit at the hip. They would not manufacture them if we would not purchase them. So it, 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 it's really a situation. The situation with, uh, with young, our young people today is much different from the way it was 20 years ago, and definitely different when I was in school. So we, we, have, to, we have to address that, this growing situation that we are really helping discrimination from the law enforcement offices. Uh, so one, one thing we can do is to really try to massage the situation. Those of us that are of good mind, speak to the police officers when you're on the street and you see one. Speak, if you go ride the bus, speak to the bus driver because they are being mistreated by a lot of, uh, a lot of people in the community. Learn to spread love. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Can I can I just say something really quick? Go ahead. I'm, I'm, ma'am, hold on. I'm asking fathers. For oh, I have two fathers over here. Okay. And then I will come back up here. I'm, I know. I got you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, go oh, ahead. Hi. I was talking. There's, there's a woman that's frustrated. I'm sorry. I'm not trying <laughs> to frustrate anyone. I know this is a passionate conversation. Just give me two more people. I'll be there. Yes, sir. I would just like to say that I think it kind of continues and perpetuates the problem if one of the answers we have is, well, young black men should learn how to kind of assimilate, assimilate better into white culture by dressing more like them, being more respectful. If you're, if you're a young white man, that's... It's not really what you're taught. I mean, we're, we're taught to go to college, be rambunctious, do pranks, get loud, drunk, act up in a lot of cases. And that's just, that's just not an option in a lot of cases. And I don't think it's fair in a lot of cases to, to expect that they should have to conform more than to, 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 to what people expect out of them. Okay, just hold on. I know, it's a, again, this is a passionate conversation, but we're not gonna get, so the purpose of this forum is reconciliation for moving our country forward. We can't reconcile if we can't hear all sides of the issue. Two fathers, I'm gonna go to this young lady up here, and then we will open it back up to the nose corral in the back, okay? All right, okay, just a minute. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I thought you were raising your hand, too. I only have one father, we're even closer. Go ahead, I got it. I got it. Oh, thank you. My name is Robert Shipman. Um, I'm, I live in Philadelphia. I, I'm from a large family, have a son, who was profiled in school. When I was young, I was profiled. Even when we moved into our neighborhood, I guess a couple years ago, we were, we were profiled just walking through the neighborhood. In Philadelphia, we're addressing, we're trying to begin the process of addressing, while we appreciate the laws and the legislations that are gonna be passed, we have to stop the violence that's happening against our boys and our youth right now. And so what we're struggling with is, what do we do? What do we tell our kids? What three, four, five things do we tell our kids to do to stay alive? when they're stopped. <clears throat> they're already profiled, doesn't matter what you have on. I have a son who went to a college in Grand Rapids, Michigan, called me on his way from the library and told me that the police were following him. He thought they were gonna um, just mess him up. He found out later that some girl had been accosted on the campus, um, young white girl, and the guy fit his description. All that I could do, I'm back in Pittsburgh at the time. I live in Philly now, but I was back in Pittsburgh at the time. All I could do was call the school, call the administrators that I knew, call a couple of pastors of churches, and say, meet my son at the precinct. My question, um, along with your bill, is are there things that our faith communities can do? Are there ways that we can maybe be safe houses in a time of crisis? Are there ways that we can set up some kind of panic situation so that if a boy or girl is in trouble, we have somewhere, we're on every block, sometimes four or five of us in one area, one street, on one street. Are there things that we can do along with um, uh, the passage of legislation to begin the process of stopping the violence that's occurring with our young people right now? So one thing too, before we move to solutions, which we need to do quickly, um, it sounds like there's a short-term and a long-term approach. I'll come around that way. Short-term and long-term approach. We're talking about how to keep young black males alive in the interim, 
but there also needs to be longer strat longer term strategies to ensure that they don't have to be careful about what they wear necessarily so they're not profiled. That's all this gentleman was saying. Like he does, he's not ever have to be told that. That's something that we tell our kids because we know that the system mm -hmm. is not fair. They're set up for failure mm -hmm. just because of how they look. That he's saying that's not his experience and it's not fair that young black men have that experience. Yes, ma'am. You want to stand in your name and Hello, I'm community activist Tisa Metro. I've been in DC 42 years all of my life. And this Trayvon Munn issue has become very large everywhere. I'm concerned about the young people in my community as an activist in Washington. I talk every day to the young people in my neighborhood and ask them, what are y'all going to do in the future? What are your future plans? I'm out in my community a lot talking to people in my neighborhood about this case, not just this case, but us as a people. And in the near future, I'm going to meet with some young people from the college campus because it's time for the 70s, 80s, and 90s babies to act. And it's time for the 50s and 60s to allow new leadership role. Let's talk a little bit about leadership role and our politicians and how they have not come to the forefront to shut down neighborhoods and actually talk to human beings, but instead have went to the middle class community and rich community, and they're doing everything in those communities, but have left the poor community out the loop. Let's so talk a lot a about that. Yes, and okay. also, um, how can we organize the young people to be able to be in the community more? Like the young people at the college campus, y'all have a safety net pretty much. But the young people in the hoods are the ones dealing with a lot of drastic situation. How do we reach out to the young people in our neighborhoods? How does the old school not be selfish and allow new leadership role to come into effect so we can take care of some of these problems? You've had your generation like that. I'm going to piggyback on what she was saying. It's time for the newer generation to come out and do that without the selfishness of the old school being in the way. Thank you. And um, she sees the day. Tiffany, I don't know if you, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I kind of wanted to speak to that a little bit. <laughs> okay, well she, she'll, she'll talk about it more, but they've already started, so they're not waiting for their turn. Dream Defenders and Tiffany have started. Definitely. So go ahead, Nia, sorry about um, that. I was right. going to say that, um, so what the Dream Defenders did, I think, inspired a lot of people, and you're right, that a lot of us, you know, we come from the safety net of being in a college community, and like, we're almost expected to be activists, because that's what college students do. That's what law students, at least those of us who are committed to social justice, that's what we do. Um, but we all have friends, mm -hmm. and we all have family, and we all have people that we know from the hood. And especially this summer, I was back in Brooklyn. I grew up mostly in Brooklyn um, throughout my life. And I was back in Brooklyn talking to a bunch of my friends or whatever, and a lot of people just, they don't know how to move forward. People in, in, in my age group, we don't know what to do. We haven't taken ownership of what we can do, and we don't really have a particular focus. Um, you know, at least 50 years ago, civil rights movement started up, and you guys had like very specific laws that you could point to the language right. and be like, listen, right. this is the problem. Right. We have this invidious, like, racial profiling happening and, and Jim Crow, it's the new Jim Crow and how do we deal with that? How do we deal with our schools falling apart? How do we deal with gun violence? How do we deal with a mental health crisis? And like it's so many things, it becomes overwhelming. And to add to that, something that someone, one of the people speaking earlier said, we don't have faith in our justice system. We don't want to commit to our justice system and, and, and work with it and work with legislators and be involved in our local and state politics more than just our federal politics. Um, I'll admit that, you know, not even two years ago, I had no idea who my congressman was. Like, I, it's, it, it's, it's who we are as a generation, and I think that many of us need to kind of reach out to not just people that we know who we have these conversations with over a glass of Merlot or whatever, but like also the people that we go back home and we're having these real conversations with our friends, like, listen, you want to change something? Um, the Community Safety Act just got, um, the veto for the Community Safety Act in New York City just got overrode by um, the city council. You know, I had a bunch of friends who were like, well, you know, I don't know, there's nothing I can do about it. You, you live in New York City, go vote in your local politics, go handle it. And um, I think that encouraging your children, your cousins, your nieces, your nephews, your community members, your church members to be involved, to take ownership, to, to stand up and really take, take our, our position as leaders, I think that that's the way to move forward. Oh, go ahead, take it. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that far. Uh, I'll just say something really quick also. Um, what, I was at a, um, a panel right after the anniversary of the March on Washington uh, not too long ago on Wednesday, the Wednesday that it happened, and we were in a room and it was all young people, 
I don't think there were any white people in there. It was all brown and like young black people in the room. And we were talking about something that was really interesting about our, our leadership and our leadership role. And I guess I actually want to take this opportunity to preach it to the choir too here. Uh, something that something that happened was we were talking about young leaders and we were talking about young people and how like the kids were leaders. And one of the things that uh, my friend sitting next to me stood up and said was, you know, when Martin Luther King or John Lewis spoke at the anniversary uh, or spoke at the uh, in 1963 at the march, he was 24 years old. Martin Luther King was like 34, 35 when he was leading, you know, the, the Montgomery bus boycott. And Diane Nash was like 17 when she first started working with these things. And and the interesting thing that I'm, I'm reading John Lewis's biography right now, um, Walking with the Wind. And the interesting thing about the difference between 1963 through the 80s and today is that we continue to label young leaders as opposed to just saying leaders. Right. And I would, I would practice and like ask this space, now that this is like a group of, I don't know, like 100 some of my people and even the panelists here, to start articulating it that way. Like I, I, young be, I love being a young person, right? Like I don't wanna be considered an old person. But if, we're, <laughs> but if we're a leader, right? But if we're leaders, nonetheless, we shouldn't be treated differently. And age does not make that difference. And, and even the young people who are in high school and the president of Howard University, me and Anthony have been friends for a long time. Like we're leaders, he's the president of the school. Like he's not a kid who's the president, he's the president, like <laughs> that's it. He's a young leader. And so when we talk about that, I would ask that this space also consider that when we talk to our peers or when we talk to Congress members or whatever. I was on Fox News getting interviewed and they called me a kid. And I was like, pause. I'm, a, I'm, I'm 24 years old. You're not going to call me a kid. I'm a young leader. So practice that, please. And when you talk to your kids, who are your kids, right? That's like the, that's like the agency. They're, that's like their, their, their relationship to you. They're your kids. But when you talk to them, let them know that they're leaders and that they're, that they're you're going to treat them like an adult. If I could vote and if I could go buy whatever I want to go buy or if I could buy a lottery ticket, I'm an adult. Like, call me a leader. Don't call me a young person or a kid because it's also degrading. So I just wanted to say that. Okay, thank you. On this, um, I think it's important. I'm going to put Alan on the spot a little bit. But I think it's important um, for you all to hear not only about the federal legislation that's a possibility, but also um, a state-based solution because some of you all in this room live in one of the 32 states where stand your ground is the law. And Alan um, is joining with a bunch of other state legislators in the Florida State Senate and the House to introduce a repeal measure. And I think it's important because again, it's not just on the legislators, there are grassroots efforts that we can all take part in to ensure we see change. So Alan, talk a little bit about your bill. First of all, let's give uh, Representative Stephen, Congressman Stephen Horst, another round of applause for putting this on. I think Angela hit it right on the head. I mean, a lot of folks want to think this is about gun control, and it's not. Uh, it's about self control. And, uh, you know, obviously we saw what happened in Colorado with the two senators or what have you. And so for uh, Congressman Horst to take this on when so many people around the country, really around the world, want to label this about gun control um, is courageous in, in that effort. But uh, one thing I do want to just take a point of personal privilege, Angela, and you know me, so I'm going to try and be very brief. But I'm a, I'm a father, and, and one of the things that was going on during that discussion about what dads would say, it, you know, I think it's right. You have to, you know, want just sow into your children, just like I do with my son and my daughter. But you have to sow into them. But also, not only your children, but other, other folks' kids, right? When you see them doing something that's probably not becoming, you have to check them then. You know, and you said, if you see, I was at a Rickards High School, my high school in Tallahassee, Florida, and I was walking down the hallway just yesterday, and I saw a young man kind of, you know, talking to a young lady, she had on her shorts, and he was kind of pulling her by the shorts, you know, trying to speak to her. I said, hold on, wait a, wait a minute, that's a young lady. One, she about, looked about the same age as my daughter, so I was worried that could be happening over at our high school, but I said, wait a minute. That's a young lady. You don't approach her like that. So I think we have to we have to talk to our young men just the same way that folks talk to us, and not be afraid or just kind of say, "Okay, well that's somebody else's child." You know, you got to be like the lady on two two seven looking out the window, you know, making sure everybody's doing the right thing. So, about stand your ground, um, we are in Florida, uh, and I have two of my colleagues here. I'm um, proud to have them here, staunch advocates for repealing stand your ground. Now we know the makeup of our legislature, just like the many of the legislatures around the country, are Republican-led. How, how likely are we gonna be able to get that? Probably not likely, but we have to move the ball down the court so someone else can get it, if not this year, next year. So if we can't get a full-on repeal, we wanna at least get a reform package put forth. 
And so the Dream Defenders who were in the Capitol uh, for 31 days, uh, pretty much in, in my legislative district, we worked with them, we provided them all the necessary uh, things they needed to, to be successful. And the one thing I want to say that Rick Scott did a very, very good job at doing. Uh, inadvertently, however, he just created a new generation of leaders. Not just the Dream Defenders, not just folks like uh, young folks that we have, young leaders like we have up here today, or leaders like we have up here today, but even the ones who came to the Capitol, we had folks there as young as six years old, sleeping yep. on the floor. And so when they come back to the Capitol, 10 years from now, five years from now, they're gonna look at that Capitol in a whole different light. And so, but we have to continue to do that. So what we're doing on Stand Your Grounds, we're, gonna, we're moving throughout the repeal, we're working with legislators in other states to have them put forth the repeal, because we know that ALEC, uh, which is funded by the Koch brothers, uh, move this initiative throughout the states in 2005 and six and seven and so forth. And so now we're trying to get those bills, laws repealed because we know we have facts. We have, and not opinions, not thoughts. We have facts that say there are more justifiable, justifiable homicides in Florida post stand your ground than before. And this whole notion about folks coming to me and say, well, Representative Williams, you're the chair of the Black Caucus. Aren't you excited? Aren't you happy that uh, there are young black men who are getting off or using stand your ground as defense when they have, you know, in the cases of drug deals gone bad or, I said, no. I said, if they're selling drugs, they should be in jail. <laughs> I said, black, white, or whatever. And so we have to make sure that we don't put a, a color on stand your ground. It may have happened to Trayvon Martin, but when this comes to the, to the front door step of someone else that may not be of brown or black hue, uh, we'll see what the response may be, but we should not allow this to be a black or brown issue. This is, this is an issue of impacting our youth and the safety of our communities. And so we're working on that. We're working on the jury selection size and the jury demographics as well. Because uh, we know in Florida we only had six folks on that jury. And we know that the jury, obviously the jury panel, just like in a lot of capital murder uh, crimes, aren't reflective of the, the district, that, uh, the community that they're in. So we're working on that. And we have many members uh, doing that in our caucus. Thank you. So, one second. So the other thing that I think is important about what Alan raised is that there are so many ways that we can address this through the legislative process. Before he started talking, we talked about grassroots efforts, what you all can do. You all can make phone calls to your members of Congress. You all can, to your state legislators. You can send emails, you can send letters. And we really have to do this if we're serious about protecting the lives of not only our young people, but human beings, period. What Alan did not say is in Florida, there was a woman who was on the other side of the gun, Marissa Alexander, who also is suffering because of the stand your ground law. He also didn't talk about Jordan Davis, who was another young African-American male that was killed after Trayvon Martin. So we really have to get through these solutions. Sister, you had a question. Hi, my name is I'm sorry, Tamara, can you, I'm sorry. Tamara Dykus, I'm uh, originally from Kansas City, um, Missouri, or Overland Park, Kansas, and um, alumni of Tuskegee University. I had a question for the panel, actually. Uh, there's like two schools of thought with imagery as it pertains to blacks, and growing up in an all-white neighborhood in Overland Park, Kansas, uh, my bro brothers kind of went through this thing uh, where, you know, they were perceived, they were frisked in front of a predominantly white school, um, they didn't have anything on, but, um, you know, a little white boy thought they, that he had a gun, so they got frisked in front of the whole school. And so I find that, you know, it, you know any difference, is, as has been touched upon, what is really suspicious, the hoodie, the baggy jeans, um, rap music, all these things that, uh, you know, the media contributing to this negative imagery. What are young people now thinking, um, you know, are they actually waking up in the morning and saying, oh, wow, I don't think I'm going to wear these baggy pants today or wear my hair natural or whatever and, you know, have the, the, the saggy pants, you know, do you tell your friends, okay, I'm not going to, you know, uh, listen to rap music anymore. When someone confronts you, you know, that happens to a white person, do you say, oh, no, you know, get along, just go along just to get along or do you actually have a voice and what are you telling your friends? Are you, as, you know, not, you, you know, boycott, are you boycotting, you know, rap music or not? Or, you know, what are some of these things in, in your mind? 
I want Silver and Jonathan to answer this question first. We got some high school students that with knowledge in here, so I want one of them to answer this first. Are you saying, like, stop listening to rap music, period? That was an illustration. <laughs> <laughs> Her question was, would you stop listening to rap music to be more? Not at all. Not, I, would not, I would never change myself because of somebody else, like, they perceive me. I'm gonna always remain Jonathan Johnson. I'm gonna die Jonathan Johnson. So um, I don't really see like I don't I don't care how people judge me because in the end they how could you judge somebody when you're trying to get to the same place as me? So I, I really don't see it. Uh, um, but how I feel about it, me being a girl who does pageants, I'm looked at as. You go to public school. Most pageant girls go to private school. You're black. You, I just recently dyed my, blonde, my hair blonde. Like, you're not supposed to do these things. I, people look at me. I have, they have a low expectation of me. And what I think we need to look at is what do, what do our young people have on the inside? What leadership programs are we setting up for our young people? How many people are coming into the schools telling these telling our young people, yes. don't let people judge you on your race. We're looked at because one black person has made a mistake and that makes the whole race. It's not that. Yes. That's what they did with 9-11. Mm -hmm. Those Muslim people made a mistake and now every Muslim has to be a terrorist. We can't look at it like that. No one needs to change who they are. Stop listening to rock music. I'm gonna let you know, I'm very diverse. I like Katy Perry, Kesha, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Kendrick Lamar. It doesn't matter what you listen to. It doesn't matter how you dress. I don't agree with people sagging their pants. Um, I'm not gonna say I don't agree with not wearing your natural hair or wearing extensions. I wear extensions, I love them. <laughs> Nothing against that. Um, but we can't, we need to stop judging people on their appearance and their color. And we need to focus on trying to empower our youth. Let them know, like, you can be something. Yes. I don't see as many programs in my school myself where we're empowering young black men, letting them know, like, most of them don't even have a father. And we don't have leadership programs telling them, you can be something more than a statistic. You can be something more than Trayvon Martin. We need to look into that. Silver, thank you for that. I think one thing that she said, and I hope that you all, especially folks that have already graduated from high school, can encourage her in this. Sometimes it takes the students to make changes in our high school. You can create the leadership program that you talked about, Silver, and you already got it. You have the bullying campaign through the pageant. So keep working on that. I think that's a great point. One of you all had questions. You did. You understand? So we got to do 15 to 20 second questions now, y'all, because we're running out of time. So Jamila Aisha Brown, I'm a member of EYP 100. So when we have these conversations, we always focus them on black men, but black women are also suffering under racial profiling and also gender non-conforming people as well, transgender folks, LGBT populations. So I'm wondering, how do we rally and stand up for everybody? Because Trayvon has dominated the conversation, but three weeks before Trayvon's murderer was acquitted, Ayanna Stanley Jones's murderer walked free from a mistrial, and he's gonna be, he's gonna be tried again in December. So how do we stand up for everybody and make sure that all black people, all people of color, are included in the conversation? Panelists? Okay, we'll let them digest oh. that and then. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> really? Um, I don't, so while they think about it though, I don't think that we, we've definitely used the tragedy of Trayvon to, as a backdrop for this conversation, but I apologize if it at all seems like we're not having this conversation in total um, for protection for all folks. And I think that the Congressman's bill, which we've talked about a great deal, and the Stand Your Ground repeal would benefit all people. Go ahead. Um, I'd just like to uh, quote Dr. Neely Fuller and I'd also encourage you to also read Francis Cressing's work, Francis Cress Wilson. He said, until you understand racism and white supremacy, everything you understand will just confuse you. Okay, so there's a lot of confusion in our community because we don't understand that there's an ongoing black holocaust from the very beginning till today. And that's my question. How can we reframe this conversation 
to acknowledge and admit that the Holocaust has never ended, yeah. it's still ongoing, and then what do we do about it once we admit that that is the reality? You all should have answered that uh, first question, huh? Right. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I'm, I don't think I have the full answer for that first question, or, you know, there's, cause there's been a lot of questions in between, uh, in between this, but I think that this kind of discussion is a discussion about, you know, profiling, racial profiling in, in total, not just, you know, African-American right. racial profiling or just brown people in general. I think we should, we should definitely include in the conversation um, how we can stop stereotypes in general. Um, and that's, that's a larger issue, that's a larger goal, and it's definitely not something that we can solve overnight. Um, I think there's, there's racial profiling for you know, Asian students. You think these, this person is good at math. Um, maybe they have the cure to cancer, and we've perpetuated the feeling that he's good at math, so he only thinks, oh, I'm gonna take these math classes, I'm gonna be a mathematics major because I am good at math, but he has a cure to cancer, and we have stifled that person's ability because we have these stereotypes. Um, about them. So I think it's, it's stereotypes in general, um, and I think those hinder progress um, for society and for people in general because uh, we perpetuate those beliefs that you, you should be this, or this is what you know, we have seen in the media or has been portrayed to us. Um, I mean, we talked about the Navy Yard shooting um, and it's interesting when you when you hear um, the descriptions that are given. Like they start, you start off with uh, black male, this height, this height. And we, the first thing that you hear is the color of that person's skin. That's the first thing that is uh, communicated to you. And it's not, oh, what was he wearing first, or what you know, what did he look like? What are his features? You know, what kind of shoes did he have on? No, it's he's a black male. This is how tall he is. Bald head. You know, this, that's the first things that you hear. So it's, it's kind of ingrains that into you. And it's a very small, maybe a small thing when you think about it, but it, it perpetuates that because that's the first thing that you see. The first thing that you're listening to is, oh, this is a black male. Okay, you know, we're looking for a black man. And um, it just helps to, you know, further perpetuate that. So really quick, um, Anthony, and we need to start wrapping up. We have um, another member who will come to close us out. But what I would like to do, because we've talked about race and racism today, we know it still exists, despite those of us who might believe we live in a colorblind society now. We talked equality and the fact that it's, in a lot of ways, separate and unequal. Backpack privilege mm -hmm. came up earlier. We've talked about repealing stand your ground, Congressman Horsford's racial profiling bill, gun safety issues, given the tragedy that happened earlier this week. What we've not talked about and what I would like for each of you to address in your own way briefly is reconciliation for moving the country forward, which is the last kind of pillar of this conversation today. Are you okay? Good. So reconciliation for moving the country forward. What do we need to do? What are our next steps as a community? Um, you can answer that. You can say what are your individual next steps for helping to move the country forward or what you think Congress or the president should do to help to move the country forward from a reconciliatory place. Reconciliatory place. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Yes. And we're going to just work our way down. Um, so you might have noticed that my common theme to a lot of uh, questions was that, you know, conversations are where a lot of these things start. And I'm going to kind of echo that theme in saying that I think that our way toward reconciliation is in having open, honest conversations as often as we can. And not just in our own communities, but we need to accept that we have allies. We are not struggling alone. We are not the only people who understand what's happening. We have many people of many races um, all over this nation and all over the world who are willing to support our, our issues. Um, and I think that in having those open, honest conversations continually as often as possible, whenever possible, you start to normalize things. You start to, instead of seeing an us and a them, you see, you see an, a we, like together. Um, and I believe that um, a point that was raised earlier about you know, student leaders raising awareness and like that in and of itself being a very powerful thing, I think it doesn't just have to be leaders um, in the student population, it can be leaders anywhere in your churches, in your communities, on your block, in your corner store, like it's anywhere, it's all of those conversations that come together to move us forward toward reconciliation. Mason? Um, I would continue what you're saying by uh, quoting what President Obama said after the Trayvon Martin killing, uh, well, after the decision was announced. And he said, I don't want us to lose sight that things are getting better. Mm -hmm. 
Each successive generation seems to be making progress and changing attitudes when it comes to race. He also said, um, and those of us of authority should be doing everything we can to encourage the better angels of our nature. And I think as long as you continue the conversation and you, and you look at this from a much larger perspective, you realize that decades ago, where we are now is, is significantly better. Um, and this is a conversation that the country has had since its inception, even before then. And I think as long as we continue that conversation, I think things will get better. And maybe not as quickly as everybody hopes. Um, I wish it was different. Um, for me, both, uh, I guess, so as a, as a country and as a world, I guess, one of the things obviously is education. I'm a big education reform person, and so I believe that while we talk about these things at HBCUs or predominantly white universities or community colleges or wherever, it's really important to also um, give people the agency to learn what they're, what, how to be civically engaged in these conversations. So we talked a little earlier about people who are in the hood and people who are in Los Angeles, where I'm from, or people who are not connected and you know don't know the name of Trayvon Martin, because there are people who don't know who Trayvon Martin is, um, or Jordan Davis. And I think that if we talk about informing, uh, reforming our education system so that people know where do you register, how do you register, when you register, how do you look up information, how do you find out who your Congress member is, how do you find out what issues and bills are, are coming up, and how do you use tr govtrack.us or .gov or whatever, and, 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 and how do you become civically engaged? If we allow our universities and our campuses to, to do that, if we force them to do that, I think we'll have a, a more politically engaged youth, and we'll have a more politically engaged community of color, and more women that are politically engaged and more LGBTQ and undocumented students who are engaged and we have to be able to, to force our campuses to do that and right now they're not. They're saying come to this campus, we teach you a couple of skills, read a couple of books, graduate, you got a degree, you got $28,000 of student loan debt, good luck. And, and so we need to change that. I think that's where we start. Um, I think we just start with stop telling our young black, not just young black people, any person, what the stereotypes not to be, but tell them what they can be. Tell them what to look forward to. Tell them that they can go to college, that they can be greater than just a, some young drug dealer, some kid getting shot, some teenager getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. Tell them that they have a future Make them, make them want to be in leadership programs and things of that sort. Thank you, Silver. Jonathan? Um, I'm the type of person that's like always wanted to be like better than what, what they expect me to be. So I'm, I'm very hard-headed in, in that type of sense. Um, I had to agree with Silver a lot. Um, just, just make sure you like like you're on a path to, to, to becoming something. Don't let them, don't let somebody already like stereotype you to what you're going to be. You got to be better than what they want you to be. That's the type of person that I always been. That's the type of way I think. <clears throat> so, so. Thank you. And Anthony? Um, yeah, so you want to just talk, just so I can get a better understanding. You want to talk about what we think is uh, some things that can be done moving forward or what yeah, are we what doing? Yeah, what can be done um, to reconcile our country with our country's past and obviously it's present. How do we kind of heal the situation and so, so that we can move forward and have a better future for our kids, for our kids' kids, um, and for everyone regardless of their race, gender, mm -hmm. for the sister that asked about this earlier, or any other barrier that could exist? How do we ensure that there's a reconciliatory process happening? Um, so one of the things that uh, we're working on at Howard is to um, is to make sure that we are, you know, lifting as we climb. So, I mean, he talked about he talked about the inspiration that he got from Howard students to uh, attend, you know, go to college. I think um, there's, I mean, I know there's over 150 organizations on Howard's campus that do mentorship programs in different schools in D.C. Um, so, just making sure that we couple those together so that students know, hey, this is where you can get. Um, that type of inspiration or, you know, we have the resources uh, to provide you with those type of, you know, those type of people that can be uh, leaders and show you uh, what it is that you can do um, to, you know, if you want to go to college, this is where you can, this is how you can, uh, this is the resources that are available for you to take that next step. Or if you want to go to a vocational school or, you know, whatever it is that you want to be good at, 
get that inspiration to you know continue to do those things and make the take the steps um, to further your career wherever your that career goes. Um, and I don't think I don't think we can just continue to talk about this. We have to we have to do something. We have to take action. We have to you know take steps, even if they're small steps. We have to show people that they can be involved and show people that the government is interactive. Like we can get involved and we can actually affect a lot of these changes. Like uh, Tiffany said, this we there is stuff that we can do right now. Like we can go back and educate each person in this room can go back and educate one person. Um, one young person, one you know older person about what what it is that we can do and how you can get involved and what um, maybe govtrack.com. What what are you what are the congressmen working on? What are they working on? Because I didn't even I mean I didn't know about it, but I mean there's people at Howard that I'm sure knew about it. Um, but you know that's that's an educational piece. We have to make sure that we're educating each and every one um, on what is being done right now to um, to affect these changes. And then um, another. You spoke about uh, the ALEC group, um, and they've, they've actually come out and said that they don't support any non-economic issues anymore. Um, but what, uh, what we want to do as Howard students is, you know, and I was actually, I actually talked about Tiffany about this, um, is writing an open letter to them because the Koch brothers uh, sponsors a lot of uh, stuff on Howard's campus. Um, and so we want to write an open letter to them just asking them, uh, do you support not necessarily stand your ground, but the looking at applic the application of that law and examining how it has affected you know different communities and how it has affected the the amount of people that have been killed um, in those communities in Florida uh, or you know in the other 28 states I think it's 28 states right um, that that has the statute or something similar to stand your ground in their law. So it's it's something that we can do right now. And it's something that we have to do right now because we can't just sit here, oh, we're just going to have conversations that you know, don't really come about to anything or don't bring anything, you know, you're just, we're just continuing to perpetuate um, this conversation and, and nothing is coming out of it. Um, and then another thing that we're really working Anthony, on this is, is your the, last thing, right? <laughs> I'm just checking. Yeah. It's the divide. It's the divide <laughs> between uh, the Howard community and the D.C. community. And it's something that's been there, I think, from the very beginning. Um, it's not necessarily something that uh, we have been able we, we can solve, per se, but we can definitely take steps like coupling our mentorship programs together or reaching out to the D.C. community and letting them know that we're, you know, we're trying, we're, we, we understand that we're an equal part of this. Um, and the DC, DC has actually been here before Howard was here. So, you know, we are, you're an important part, we're an important part. We want to work together uh, in improving the community, and that's something that we're doing. So, thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> so, this has been a tremendous panel. Um, thank you all so much for your time. out one thing that Silver said that I hope that we can take with us before Congressman Horsford comes up to wrap up with Congressman Jeffries. She said, tell our young people what they can be instead of just not what they, or instead of just what they can't be. So that's a really important point, Silver. I hope you take that back to school with you. Congressman Horsford, it's all yours. Thank you. Let's give these young people, the, these leaders, a round of applause. I really enjoyed hearing your perspective. And I, I think as older folks, we need to listen more to young people. Uh, I consider myself a, a young member of Congress. Uh, and sometimes we don't even get a chance to be heard enough. But it's their experience that's going to shape the change that will come. And as uh, they talked about on their panel, you know, other young leaders took their rightful place at times that caused for the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, to become law. And we need to make sure that young people help to shape the debate at the local, state, and federal level. I want to thank our representatives, uh, Representative Williams and the other representatives from Florida, uh, for joining in all of you. This is the beginning of the conversation. I'm glad we started for, uh, hearing from these leaders who happen to be young as the opening session for the ALC, but it's not going to end here. It will continue throughout uh, this weekend, and uh, we appreciate it very much. Let me just provide a little bit of my uh, comments, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. 
Um, as Angela said, and let me give uh, Angela a round of applause as our moderator. A lot of times we look at a person and the success of the person and the title of the person, but we don't understand what it is they've experienced to get to where they are. And one thing I always try to share with any young leaders that I talk to is, is part of my story. So I just want to close with that and then turn it over uh, to my uh, colleague, uh, Representative uh, Jeffries. It's not about me being a congressman or a former state senator. I was raised by a single mother, the oldest of four kids. My mother overcame drug addiction and is now clean and sober going on 20 years. My father was shot and killed when I was a young boy. Um, and I've experienced being profiled. And I wasn't wearing a hoodie either. Our young black boys, in particular, not exclusively, have been um, stereotyped for far too long. And it is time for us to say enough is enough. No other community would tolerate this with their young people. And it's time for us to say enough is enough. So it was my experiences growing up and now as a father of three, two of whom happen to be boys, and I want my daughter to have uh, someone who she can spend the rest of her life with. Uh, so I want to make sure that we do our part in addressing uh, the racial profiling and other policies that have plagued our young boys for far too long. And it is something that the Congressional Black Caucus is serious about. Uh, we will accept the President's invitation to have a dialogue about what needs to change in policy and in practice and in law at the federal, state, and local level. And we challenge all of us to come together to move these initiatives forward. And I think we heard from a number of individuals today very specific things that each of us can do individually and collectively around that reconciliation that we all want to see. Uh, but one person that I'm very honored to serve with, uh, we on a regular basis have uh, what we call an hour of power uh, on Monday nights where we take to the floor of the House of Representatives to bring these issues to the forefront. These are not the issues that dominate Congress right now. They should be. And that's part of the debate that we're trying to change. Uh, my friend and colleague, Representative Jeffries. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, to my good friend, Stephen uh, Horsford, so thankful to him uh, and the tremendous work that he's already done as a member of Congress uh, and the work that we will be doing together as we move forward. He mentioned uh, that every Monday, uh, him and I co-anchor the Congressional Black Caucus's special order where uh, every Monday that the Congress is in session, we'll speak uh, and lead a discussion on a variety of issues from the floor of the House of Representatives. Uh, and I've called it uh, an hour of power. Horsford calls it must-see TV. Uh, <laughs> but we need you guys to tune in because it's where we are attempting uh, to give voice to the issues that you care about to Angela Rye. Uh, who is uh, incredibly distinguished, as I'm sure you've heard from her elegance uh, and her eloquence today. Uh, and to all of uh, these panelists, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to wrap things up, and I'll be extremely brief. I, I think that you know, we live in a very tremendous country, a great country. I was reminded of that fact uh, when earlier in the year, Horsford and I were freshmen, so we got the opportunity as new members of Congress to participate uh, in the inauguration of the president. But, you know, we just got here, and so we're sitting way up at the top. But the bleachers. One of the things about sitting up at the top is you get to see everything. And so it was a wonderful thing to look out into the crowd and see people from all across America who had come to this inauguration. Of course, the first black president was there uh, in front of everyone being sworn in for the second time. Right. And then I was struck by the fact that right next to him you had Justice Antonin Scalia, and right next to Scalia you had Speaker John Boehner, and right next to Boehner you had 
former vice presidential nominee Paul Ryan. <laughs> and right next to those three, Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> This is a great country we live in. But you know, despite its greatness, we know that we've come a long way, but in America, we still have a long, long, long uh, way to go. And as it relates to the issues of the intersection between the criminal justice system, of course, and how that system treats people of color generally, African American and Latino men most specifically, but all of us, uh, we know that significant reform is necessary. And in New York, uh, which is ground zero for racial profiling in my view, with the intense stop and frisk program that has been undertaken for the last decade or so by the current mayor and the current police commissioner, where each and every year over 500,000 people stopped, questioned, frisked, embarrassed, humiliated, in some instances, brutalized. When the overwhelming majority of those individuals, in court, according to the NYPD's own statistics, have done nothing wrong. 90% of the people subjected to stop, question, and frisk encounters, not according to Jeffries, according to the NYPD, no gun, no weapon, no drugs, no contraband, no basis for the stop whatsoever. And so we decided this is something that can't be tolerated. It bears no relationship to crime fighting. In fact, I think it undermines the ability for the police to be effective because it poisons the relationship between law enforcement and the community. And so we've been fighting it for a long time, just like I would encourage each and every one of you to fight whatever form of racial profiling you confront in the areas and communities where you're from. We've been fighting it for a long time, but the good news is that the fight has yielded progress. It's yielded progress. We passed legislation to begin to reform it in 2010 that I was proud to sponsor when I was a state legislator. Governor Patterson signed it into law. We recently had the city council pass a strengthened racial profiling bill and create an independent inspector general for the police department that was signed into law over the objection of the mayor. We had the, the New York uh, Manhattan Federal Court declare stop and frisk unconstitutional and impose amongst many, many things a monitor over the police department. And we had all of the mayoral candidates on the Democratic side declare uh, that stop and frisk would be dramatically changed and reformed when they are elected into office. And we've got a Democratic nominee right now who perhaps was the most outspoken critic of stop and frisk, and he emerged to be uh, the nominee and will likely to be the next man. So the good news is that, as Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. But with struggle, year after year after year, in New York City, we've finally seen some progress. And that's why uh, your voices are incredibly important in moving the dialogue and the discussion and the public policy forward. As Representative Horsford said, this is a tremendous starting point. And we're going to be along with you for the ride. And let me just end with this thought. Uh, Dr. King, of course, famously observed that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And we in the CBC, we think what that means is that, yeah, in this world, there's some good folks and there's some rough folks. But in order for progress to be made, all you really need is just a few good folks to work hard, band together, sacrifice, dedicate themselves to progress in America and in the world. And at the end of the day, just like Dr. King said, justice will prevail. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. God bless each and every one of you.